Excuse me, okay. We thought we would take this time to really talk about the holistic overview of what's going on in real estate. So if you're watching and you're interested in the market and you have questions, I promise you this will be worth your while. Um, Tim, I, I have a feeling we're not gonna have a lot of live viewers on because it's kind of midday and people are probably sure. working. Um, if we do and you have questions, you can ask them in the uh, question, in the, obviously the comment section. And if, if you see this later and you comment, Tim or I will jump on that and make sure that we get you the answers to the questions that you're looking for. So I also just wanna jump on my profile here and have my uh, page up so that if anybody does ask questions, we can field them. So Tim, welcome my man. Thank you, brother. I know some people know who you are, but why don't we take this time to introduce, the, uh, introduce yourself and maybe let people know who you are, what you do, and why should we take your advice? Appreciate that. Tim Christensen, mortgage loan officer with uh, Cross Country Mortgage. Been in the mortgage industry since 1986, so I've seen a few ups and downs and survive them. And that is where I come in handy with my experience and my honesty and I've survival techniques in this industry because a lot of a lot of ones come and go, but uh, I'm still here. And I love helping folks get into a home, whether it's their first one, move up or uh, their last one. Yeah, I mean, we, you and I definitely have our fair share of clients we work with. And I think one thing for sure is no two clients have the same story. Right on. Right? So it's, it's really cool because our experience definitely plays a role, but there's always something with, with every client. And every time we do a transaction, we learn, we get better, we get stronger, right. uh, and we, we move forward together. And, and also, um, for anybody watching that may not know who Tim is, uh, Tim was the in-house lender at Century 21 uh, when I first got into the business 14 years ago. And uh, at the time, I had no network. And Tim was in there every day with a smile on his face and we got to know each other and we've just developed this relationship that has been ongoing. So when I say to my clients, I trust Tim implicitly to help you, I truly do. So anybody that's watching, what Tim says is usually what I go by. Um, so thanks again for being here, Tim, and for being a trusted okay. resource. So why don't we start out with kind of your overall vibe in your world, like consumer confidence, applications, what, what's the general consensus in, in your world right now? What I'm seeing, and it's been somewhat steady, but it kind of has spiked up. I hate to use that term spike, but uh, the increase in pre-approval applications and not, for, not necessarily people looking to buy right now, but people to buy six months, 12 months down the line. They feel more confident that the interest rates are going to stay where they're at. Honestly, that's what they're going to be low this year, next year, and maybe even uh, 2022. So there's no rush to get out there, but they all want to know, hey, where can I buy? What can I do? What can I do now? And where can I be later on down the line? And that has, has increased tremendously. I'd say probably five times as many people in the summertime are reaching out and asking these questions than were um, during the lockdown, so the serious lockdown when we started up. Um, but people are more, more, more confident about not necessarily a full turnaround, but they have their jobs. They know they're going to keep their jobs and they can look to the future. Yeah. You know, I always call that the information gathering stage. And, you know, I think a lot of people that haven't purchased a property or haven't done in a while or sold a property in a while, I think they think that if they were to talk to a real estate agent, that they're putting themselves in a position to do something sooner than they actually want to do it. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't really want to reach out to, you know, I hear this all the time. Um, why don't we meet when it, we're getting closer to me buying or selling? Or if I meet a new buyer and I say, well, you know, I'd love for you to talk to a lender so we can understand your situation financially. So we know kind of, we can build a roadmap. And they're like, well, I'd rather talk to a lender when I'm getting closer to buying, you know? And I think, I honestly think that's the worst thing that you can do. I, my right. opinion is, um, I'll give you an example. Um, I get coached by a coaching company, the Tom Ferry organization. And I remember I one time, a long time ago, I met with Tom and um, I was thinking about switching coaches. I just didn't feel the connection there. I felt that I outgrew my coach and I, I had lunch with Tom and I was like, Tom, let me ask you a question. When's the best time to switch coaches? And he said, honestly, the fact that you're thinking about it means you should probably do it. Right. And so that's kind of the, the way I work in life in general is if I'm thinking about something, I want to get it off my plate by learning more about it. Right. And I think that's exactly what buyers and sellers should do. You know, you hit the nail on the head, whether you want to buy or sell in one month or in two years, 
Let's get together. Let's see what that looks like. I think a lot of times people have this perfect world in their head about how they want things to go down and it very rarely goes that way. So it's like, let's just be sure that we're going to eliminate all roadblocks and put you in a position to do what you want to do when you want to do it by meeting now and figuring it out, right? There's no cost and there's no obligation. So it's really good to hear that people are coming in and like planning with you versus yeah. I'm ready to buy, give me a pre-approval. Right. You know what and I mean? The, and what, what I'm seeing, the, the smoothest transactions, the easiest from start to finish are the ones who come in six months ahead of time and say, let's start learning. Let's start the education process. And when we get to that finish line, they're like, wow, this was easy. But it's all because we did all the work early on. But right. you know, they, they, lo they love it. It's easy because we've done this before and we know what works, right? If you do something 10,000 plus times, eventually you're going to figure out how to make it work really well. So, and, and I think, I think that's what I want. A lot of the viewers that, that are watching here, it's like, Hey, we're not that scary. We actually want to help. And we're not going to push you into making a decision that you're not ready to make if it doesn't, if it's not in your best interest, right? Cause we grow our business by referral. I mean, what's, right. The last thing we need is somebody going out there and saying, oh my God, I worked with Robert and Tim and they pressured me into buying a home that I hate. Like, yeah, no, I'm good with that. What we want is people singing our praises. And for that to happen, you just have to do good work and you have to help people. Um, and planning is a real big part of that. So awesome. Um, let me share a little bit about what's going on in my world in terms of vibes. So I would say in general, um, we are seeing an uptick in people that are reaching out and saying, hey, we kind of want to see like we heard the market's really good and we've been doing whatever they've been doing and we want to see if we qualify. So it's really nice to see people coming and planning because one of the statistics that I've used for many years is 87% of buyers start their home search by looking for a home first before they talk to a lender. And you and I both know that should be flip-flopped. 87% of people should really be getting pre-approved, right? And that's one thing that's come from COVID that I think is a good thing is that on our listings and the listings that we show, about 85% of them require a pre-approval upfront prior to looking at the home. The seller basically says, I wanna sell my home, but if you can't show me that you have the ability to buy it, you can't come into my house. And so buyers are now being forced to do the right thing and get pre-approved because now that you have it, it's easy, right? So yeah. it's been fantastic because anytime we get any pushback, I tell the person, not only is this in your best interest, but it's required now. So if you yeah. want to see this house, you got to talk to Tim, right? So, uh, so or, or a lender, right? Obviously, I can't make everyone yeah. talk to you. I wish they would. I can't make them. <laughs> but if they've got somebody they trust, Tim and I are big um, fans of respecting other people's relationships. And I know that because, Tim, that's happened to us several times. Yeah. So if you've got a relationship, that's fine, too but Tim is always a resource. So in terms of things that are good other than buyer confidence, um, you know, let me see here. I actually took a couple notes. I'm throwing Tim on the spot, but I have notes. Uh, let's see here. Um, our business is up about 350%. That's pretty good. Uh, what that, you know, we, we've actually sold more homes in the last six weeks than we did the, the previous four months, right? And, and that's not a way to tap myself or the team on the back. That's just we've had a lot more people reach out to us and say, we need help, right? So we're seeing massive amounts of consumer confidence. Some of the bad inventory is really low, right? So it's like a double-edged sword because our sellers are like, it's the best time to sell because of inventory and our buyers are looking at slim pickings. Um, other things COVID related are, it's a challenge to show properties, right? We've got to make sure we follow safety protocol. We have to make sure our, our listings are clean. We have to make sure that our buyers are safe, our sellers are safe. We have to post disclosures around our listing, you know, little, little common sense disclosures to let people know they should be washing their hands and not touching things. And if they have a fever, don't come in. There's a lot of this minutia that's kind of built in around the COVID and the real estate market, but it's what we got to do to make it happen. Right? Um, right. And then I think too, there's still fear and uncertainty and I'm seeing a lot of fear and uncertainty in two aspects of the market. Number one, I'm seeing it happening. Um, in terms of uh, is the market going to crash, which I know you and I are going to talk about today and why we don't think that's going to happen. But secondly, and a very legitimate concern, a lot of people are concerned that they may not have steady employment, right? So like we've got clients that are like, Robert, we've got great income, down payment, our credit's through the roof. 
but I'm not sure if I'm going to have this job in a year. So it makes me scared to commit to, you know, a loan, yeah. buying a house, all legitimate, right? So there are still economic concerns that are affecting the market, but in general, it's booming right now. It is, it is pretty booming. So um, let's see here. So I've got a couple slides I want to bring up and I'd love to get your take on it. And uh, I'm going to share my screen with you guys. Let me see if I have any questions. No questions. Okay. Share screen. Let's see here. I'm on Facebook. Uh, so here's the first slide. Can you see that, Tim? Yeah. Okay, cool. So that means everyone can see it. So this is inventory year over year since 2017. And uh, the different lines and the different years are color coded. So if you can see right now, we are the blue line, right? So we are at the lowest inventory we've seen in years. And to give you any like reference that the, uh, the purple line is 2017. And in my opinion, 2017 was one of the more aggressive markets. What, what are your thoughts, Tim, in terms of the last three years? Which market did you see, I think, the most growth in? You hit the nail right on the head that 2016 was such a, a low interest rate market, more affordability, and prices were so much lower than where they're at now that things kind of did shift after that. So 2017, I'm looking at it. Uh, 2018, um, that was a phenomenal year early on. But like I, looking at that chart right there, look at the amount of listings up. That's, yeah. that, that tells me that, you know, nobody was really, people were kind of waiting and waiting and waiting. Um, all, all I know is that when I look at 2020 and where we're heading with property, um, properties on the market and property values, that's, again, what tells me there's not going to be anywhere near a crash. It's complete opposite of where we were in 2008 when the market did crash. Yeah, and I've got some cool slides to share with you there. But what, what blows my mind here is that, 2017 was a tough market for buyers. And I remember having many buyers missing out on properties and multiple offers. Yeah. 2018 provided some relief. Uh, and, and 2019 provided more relief as the inventory grew, right? 2018 it, it was this time in 2018, we had over 7,500 homes available in the entire county. And sometimes when I tell people that, they go, oh, that's not a lot. And sometimes people go, wow, that's so many. Let me just help you people that are watching understand this. If there are 7,500 7, homes available in the entire county, first of all, you have to make sure you break it down per city. And then when you break it down per city, you're breaking it down into one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, four bedrooms, five bedrooms, and so on. You've got condos, you've got townhouses, you've got single family residences, you've got different price ranges, right? 200 to 300, 300 to 400. When you actually break it down to the, to the lowest common denominator, which is like a neighborhood in a city in a price range, some of our clients have four to 10 options, right? And the crazy thing is, is now we're hovering below 5,000. It's actually, we've actually seen a de decline since May. Right. May. May was our peak this year and we've seen a decline. So for anybody that purchased a home in the last three years and and, and understand how challenging it was, multiply that by 10 for 2020. Yeah. You know what I mean? So for anybody out there that's like, why the heck are homes selling for so much and selling so fast? It's supply and demand. And right now we're experiencing some of the lowest supply we've ever experienced in a really long time. So let's do this. The second slide. So here is demand, right? Right. So, so Obviously, we see this massive V-shaped recovery that a lot of us were talking about. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to be straightforward and honest and, and put my ego to the side. I did not see a V-shaped recovery. My opinion was that we were probably going to see more of a U or an L. Um, but I was proven wrong, and I'm glad I was. I'm glad I was because a lot of people were depending on the market to achieve their goals. I mean, what are you seeing here, Tim? I mean, is this look pretty, you know, all, in line with what you're experiencing. I mean, it looks like we've shot right back up and we're at the highest point, basically we have been since the peak in 2017. And just from, again, that from the, just that B that we're looking at, you look, see April, May, when it, of course it shut down, nobody was seeing property. Those, the people in that created the B are the people who really wanted to buy in January, February, and were interested in getting educated to find the right place. COVID hit, stopped, and, 
when things kind of opened up a little bit so they can go out and see properties, boom, they hit the market and there it is. They're just buying everything that's available and there's not much available in the good places, that's for sure. Yeah. That's awesome. So, so I, you know, I like to show these slides because I think they, they definitely kind of bring things to perspective here. So here's your world, right? Here are interest rates. And I, I love yeah. this graph. It's only, since Jan it's only since January of 2016. So, so, you know, tell us what you're seeing here and, and tell us what we all know, because right now, a lot of the reasons why the market is the way it is, is for really two reasons. Well, technically three, in my opinion, but the two main reasons are supply is so low yep. and the cost to borrow money is so low. So low and it's lower than where it is. Rents are still going up, yet interest rates continue to go down, which make mortgages that much more affordable. And this exactly shows why. 2019 was the way that it was. We were in, we were nearing 5% on an interest rate back yep. then, which kind of slowed the progress down. But now we're at a point where it is so much, it's cheaper to buy than it is to rent. I helped a young couple buy out, um, get a property that was $100 less per month, including taxes, association dues, everything, than it was for renting. And they got a bigger place. It, it's it's hard to argue with it when these rates are low. It's, it's, it's an easy sale for me. I mean, like, hey, would you like would you like a 3% rate? It's not something that people say, no, no, that's way too high. Yeah, yeah, no one's, no one's giving you any pushback on the rates, right? I'm sure you got a few people that are like, come on, you can do better than that. Yeah, <laughs> for sure, for sure. And I don't blame them, I would ask too. And who knows, the market might get there. Yeah, yeah, so, so it's the, the super low inventory coupled with the, the super low interest rates and it's just making it right now, people just wanna buy. And we're, we're both seeing that. Exactly. Um, so this is a pretty cool slide. Uh, I came across this one recently. Um, by the way, these slides I'm getting, they're coming from the Stephen Thomas Orange County Housing Report All right. and Keeping Current Matters. Uh, so for any real estate agents that are watching this, uh, you know, Keeping Current Matters is a fantastic resource for global real estate trends. Um, Tell me what this graph, uh, or what this tells you. Um, housing affordability index, Tim. What do you see here? Well, you're looking, of course, right after the, the market crash, where we have the distressed properties that dominate the market. Um, it's, it, it's, it's in the past. It is something that's not going to happen anytime soon, that's for sure, because of many different factors, which we'll talk about. But you can see that the number, it just keeps going up and up and up over here. And that's more based on people's income and people's and the interest rates. We didn't have the interest rates or the income back then when, the, when we had the distressed properties, which is why the property values were so doggone low. Now we're at a point where it's affordable, but property values are at record levels. It's, it's amazing. It's hard to, hard, to, hard to put into words. Well, I think you did. So income, <laughs> income has gone up and interest rates have come down, which means that what you could afford three or four or five years ago yeah. is lower than what you can afford today at the same payment, right? Or a similar payment or in terms of affordability because your income has gone up as well. So um, it just goes to show how strong the market is now compared to, you know, in the past. So true. Right. people are making um, smarter decisions too. That's another, that's another good thing. Absolutely. 2008 was not a smart time. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was a challenge for a lot of people. So, so let's talk a little bit about why this isn't going to be like 2008. Uh, and again, this is speculation for anybody that's watching. Tim and I don't have a crystal ball, yeah. but there are so many different factors that we're considering when we tell you this. So, um, you know, in, in 1999 to about 2005, we were in a seller's market. And for a lot of people who are like, is it a seller's market, is it a buyer's market? The way we determine that is through the absorption rate. So if you look here, six months to seven months worth of inventory tells us that we're in a neutral market. No one has the upper hand. If we're below six months in inventory, um, it's a seller's market. And obviously the lower in terms of months, the stronger of a seller's market it is. To, in a nutshell, the way we figure out the absorption rate is we look at how many homes are on the market, and then we look at how fast are homes actually selling. So let's say, for example, there are 100 homes on the market in your area, and every month, 20 of those homes are selling, right? Now, we know that more homes during that month are coming on the market, but if, let's just say, no other homes hit the market, at the rate homes were selling, 
it would take five months to deplete the inventory. That's called the absorption rate. And so right now we're hovering between, you know, in Orange County, we're between three and four months on average. Obviously some areas are lower than others, yeah. right? But the cool thing with this graph is inventories was really low um, during that period. And then in 2006 to 2012-ish, uh, inventory went up dramatically, right? And, and that created such a huge buyer's market that sellers really had no room to negotiate. Now we're back to really low inventory, really low rates. But Tim, what are some reasons that you think we're not going to see another 2008 crash? In 2008, we were in a situation where we didn't require equity and we didn't, as lenders, and we didn't look at credit and income like we do now. And at that time, it was just, it was just so easy to get into a home. And you saw that, that, that graph it really shows you know, the, the savvy sellers were out there. Uh, I better put my property on the market now because it's, it's going to get worse. And the signs were there. We're in a situation right now where when, if you get your loan approved, that means you accomplish something. That's like getting a degree because um, we, we're checking everything. And especially for the self-employed buyers, it's, it, there's so much stuff that goes on behind the scenes that if you're approved, then you know you're golden. You're in fantastic shape. And on top of that, you know, the number is about 43% equity is in America right now. On and average, 43, right? Yeah, on yeah. average. That, I mean, that means people have that much money in their home sitting there in equity. So nobody's going to rush out there and just foreclose. They're going to make sure that they make those payments because they got all this money in the bank. People were getting foreclosed upon because they had less, they had negative equity in the property. No, no skin in the game. No skin in the game. No skin There's in the no, game. No way anybody's going to walk away from equity when they got a nice big chunk, especially in Southern California where that 10% equity could be $100,000. That's a lot of money. So combat that with lenders who are able to help and these lower interest rates, there's just not going to be a situation where we're giving away stupid loans to uh, stupid houses that aren't approved and appraised and everything like that. We, we did some stupid things. <laughs> and the bottom line is we're not doing it. We're, we paid the price for it and we're not doing it. Yeah, that's exactly right. The, I mean, look, there's a lot of things we can talk about when we compare this market to 2008, but the two in my book are the quality of loans, right? Nowadays, if, if you can't, show the bank that you can pay this mortgage back on a monthly basis, you're just not gonna get a loan. Right. Everything's verified, right? I mean, so it's, it's crazy. Um, but then on the, on the uh, and then the flip side is too, so many people have equity. And that was the one thing that I remember in 2008, that was right when I got into the business and I, I was talking to people that were like, yeah, I bought, I bought this home um, with 100% financing or I got a negative amortization loan and I bought it for 900,000 and the market crashed and now I can't get more than eight, right? And so it's like, okay, well, you know, here's your options. Let's spend the next 18 months dealing with the bank and trying to short sell this property. And these people are like, I, I got no skin in the game, let them foreclose, right? And if enough people do that, it, it, it creates a massive ripple effect. And exactly like what you said, if people are forced to sell for one reason or another, yeah. for financial reasons, there's just too much equity. Are we going to see some foreclosures and some short sales? I'm sure we will. Yeah. But is it, it's not going to be like the majority. I mean, I remember at one point in 2009 or 10 where, I mean, God, I feel like it's more, but at least 50%, if not more, the properties were distressed. I want to say it was more. It was like 80%. It just seemed like it. That's for sure. It just seemed, I just felt like every single transaction, every client I worked with, it was just it was so complicated and so challenging and, and it required so much patience. And nowadays we're just not seeing it. So um, I think something really big and, and I don't even know where COVID falls on the big scale, but something really big and completely unexpected would have to happen for us to see the type of crash. That was like a once in a lifetime crash in my opinion. Yeah. So There's stock gaps in there, it's not going to happen again. We would need interest rates to go to six, seven, 8% for, us to really crash and that's not happening anytime soon that's for sure absolutely um I, there's a couple more graphs i want to share this is kind of a cool one right so it talks about expected market time the share of inventory the share of demand and then how many days it took to sell this type of home last year and so what we're seeing is that in orange county 
first of all, 75% of homes that are listed are priced at or below a million dollars, right? So just anybody out there kind of curious, but look at it. I mean, it took 664 days on average to sell a home that was between zero and 750K and nowadays it's 32. Yeah. Look, at, look at the 4 million plus price point, 667 days last year, now hovering in around the 240 mark, right? So everything, I mean, one and a half to 2 million literally cut in half almost. You know, or actually less, less than half. Yeah. Right. And so we're seeing homes selling. And again, that falls down into the supply and demand category. And then the, and the interest rates. Now, I don't know how many people, uh, you know, I don't have the statistics for how many people buy cash versus get a loan in the one and a half plus price point. True. But I know that, that people are, right? I know that people are getting loans. We have clients that are buying three, $4 million properties and they're getting loans sometimes. So they, it just depends on the client and how they want to leverage their financial portfolio. I got one last slide to talk about here. And, uh, you know, this is something that we've, we've discussed in the past. Yeah. Uh, this is forbearance, right? So it says of all active forbearances, which are past due, their mortgage, uh, their mortgage payment, 77% have at least 20% equity. So just to go back and confirm what you said, and you, you said this before, banks don't want to foreclose on homeowners. They, they don't, don't want to own real estate. <laughs> yeah, so, so people have money and they're going to find ways to work through it. But I think that the key factor, one of the biggest key factors in why this market is still very stable is because homeowners want to stay in their homes. They want to keep their homes. They have too much invested in their homes. They're going to fight for it. And that was the one thing we didn't see in 2008 to 2012. Dude, nobody was fighting for it. Nope, they it won't. was just, it was like fighting Mike Tyson. You know, you're going to lose. Might as well just run out of the ring. <laughs> 13 seconds. I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. So I hope I didn't bore everybody too much with um, all the slides, but I thought there were some valuable slides there. Tim, I want to, you know, I'd love to kind of segue a little bit into, uh, I know that when we first started, um, you know, some of those, uh, uh, the loans that were a bit more creative were pulled. Uh, I know Jumbo kind of got impacted a little bit by COVID. Can you give us a little bit of a, a loan update for anybody that's watching? From the, from the standpoint of the Jumbo loans, especially, they've kind of, they're slowly crawling back into the market, getting a little bit more aggressive. The rates are still a little higher than the, where I think they should be, but they're coming back down to earth and being something more affordable. And they're loosening up the guidelines to where we can do 10% down on a Jumbo. We can do... Um, 660 lower FICO score kind of things. I wrote down some other information here. Um, and the different loans that, that we had to stop, like uh, bank statement qualifying for self-employed folks, asset depletion, which is a, a qualifying mechanism for people with a lot of cash, but maybe low on income, um, where they don't want to use all their cash, put it for the down payment, put some for the down payment, use the others to help pay the mortgage. That is back in and being looked at and funding. The best part is, is that it's funding. I had loans in March and April that just nobody wanted to fund them anymore. So I said, okay, we'll have to just sit back and wait. They're starting to look at them and they're starting to fund again as well. Um, also no mortgage insurance programs for jumbo loans. Really, it's gonna, it's all, it, you're gonna get the most bang for your buck if you have a high FICO score when it comes to jumbos. It's always been that way. It will continue to be that way high FICO scores and throw in cash in reserve. You have uh, large sums of money in retirement accounts. Those are used to help uh, in the qualifying scenario to where we can push ratios on jumbo loans. It's not as easy as it is in the regular uh, loans from 765, 600 and lower, but they're opening up slowly but surely as one funds and then the investors buy it and they, they work, then more loans will be available for most folks. But on the, on the financing side, the only thing that I'm running into would be the, the, the uncertainty of the shutdowns. And when you have people who are on jobs that require income from working in the public, um, service folks, and of course, self-employed folks who work directly with the with the public, we've got to, we've added one more layer of uh, making sure everything's okay, and that is where we look at a current bank statement for the business to see if there's money coming in. If there's money coming in, we're qualified. If there's not, then we know that they're, they're being affected, and we have to wait on funding loan until uh, until they're back in business. That's the only thing that's I've seen that's a negative, but it's justifiable. Gotcha. All right, so. 
at the end of the day, you guys are making it happen. It seems like things are getting back to kind of more of a common sense type lending. It really is. It really is. You know, if you could show us that you can pay us back, we got your back kind of deal. That's really all it boils down to. You're going to pay us back? Yeah, you get a loan. <laughs> so you're still, you're still getting jumbos through and you're making it happen for the right people. For the right people. Exactly. Exactly. It's happening. Slowly but surely. Awesome, man. So cool. If anybody has any questions, you can post them again in the comment section. Um, and then look, if you're going to watch this later and, and post, um, that's fine too. We'll get back to you. So Tim, what I want to do here is uh, I want to talk a little bit about the types of people that we're helping. Yeah. Um, for two reasons. Number one, if anybody that's watching this kind of feels a connection and says, hey, I, I definitely want to explore my options and they want to reach out to us, I want to let them know about how different our clients are, right? There's a lot of different people out there. We talked earlier about how no two clients are the same. Right. Um, so I'm going to start off and I just want to share a few of the different, I mean, look, my team works anywhere, works with anywhere between let's say 50 and 75 buyers at any given time, all in different stages or sellers, all in different stages, um, all very unique scenarios. But like to give you a few examples, we've got a lot of first time home buyers we're, we're working with. Some of them are ready to go and they've been saving and they have money and they've been doing research and they have a good job. And others are like, kind of like what you said, it's, hey, I don't want to miss the boat. I want to see what it even looks like to buy a house and do I even qualify? Right. So we're starting from like the ground ground level. I've got relocation buyers, families that are moving into Orange County for schools. They're moving here for the lifestyle. I've got a family moving from Washington State to Orange County because they've always wanted to live near the beach. They both work for Nordstrom's headquarters and they were both informed during quarantine that they no longer have to come back to work and they can work virtually if they desire. And so they're moving to Orange County because they're like, Psh, we still got a job. We can work virtually. We want to live by the ocean. That's what we've always wanted to do. They're coming here. I've got clients moving out of California and moving to other areas for one reason or another. Some family, some because they're retiring. Some want to just get out of California. Um, popular places people are going in my world, Idaho, Arizona, Texas, Colorado. I'm seeing a lot of overlap yeah. with clients. Unfortunately, I've got clients that are going through a divorce. I've got people that are getting married that want to buy their first home. Um, people that are downsizing because kids have moved out. People that are upgrading because during COVID, they're like, yeah, we don't like our home as much as we did because we're here a lot. So we want a pool or we want more outdoor space or we want an, an extra bedroom or we want a gym. Um, and then a big one for us, which has been really fun, is Airbnbs. So not only people that own Airbnbs that are fed up with it, that are selling them, but people that are buying Airbnbs um, because they want to add to their portfolio. And majority of the clients we're working with on Airbnbs right now are actually people that want to buy a second home, but they want to rent it out while they're not there. So if they know they're going to come four times a year, they're going to black those dates out. And then they have a property management company rent their place out. And they're, they're going to, there's an ROI on that. They're making money oh, yeah. on those, on that rent. Because their short-term rental rates are significantly higher than long-term rental rates. Right. And now they have a quote-unquote free place to go when they visit, right? So I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, dozens of different types of people. But at the end of the day, what it comes down to is people want to buy or sell because something has happened in their life. And that involves a real estate purchase or sale. So that's kind of what I'm seeing. Tell us about a few of your buyers um, that, you're, or, that you're working with. And, and people that are refinancing too, is that happening a lot? It's happening a lot. And with uh, a lot of people with homes already that are doing, they're, they're, they're seeing this low, this low interest rate market and saying, I'm going to go debt free. And then I talk with them about, let's go debt free. Let's get rid of that. And then be smart with it and take that money you're going to save, whether it's a thousand bucks a month on credit cards and other stuff or $1,500. And let's apply that towards your principal, pay down your mortgage, get that thing out of the way become debt free in your, in your forties or fifties and sixties like that, instead of carrying that mortgage forever. Um, I'm all about getting rid of mortgages. <laughs> yeah. Honest. Right. But I'm, I'm, the, I'm also seeing folks that have a property right now. They're saying, okay, I'm going to position myself in a year from now to buy a property because I believe in the market. I believe these interest rates are going to be where they're at. So they're clearing out the debt. They're putting money away so that they can have it for that down payment later because they want to hold back that property and 
that they have right now and rent it out. It's too small for them. And that segues into what I'm seeing the most of are people who are homebound and now they can work from home, but they have a two bedroom place and it's just not enough room. They need an office. And if it's a married couple, you need two offices. So you need a bigger place there. Yep. Um, also, the biggest thing, the most, the majority of my first time home buyers are ones who are with child. Um, all of a sudden they realize, wow, I've got a child. I have uh, maybe another one on the way and I really want to have a home of our own for it. I can't handle this rent situation because like I said, since 2010, we've seen it rent just go up right through that, that square that I'm looking at. I'm in right now while, while mortgages keep going down and they just said, hmm, you know what? I want to make sure my kids taken care of and we won't have to be struggling with rent. So we're buying a, the right size home and we're going to get a fixed payment and not have to worry about it. It's, it's a complete change from where it was a couple of years ago where the kids all said, nah, I don't want to own any real estate. They want to own real estate. It's fantastic. Yeah. Anybody else, any, uh, any crazy complicated situations that you've got going on? I've got divorces too. That's for sure. Whether what, where one buys them, the other out and then the other one has to take uh, the money and go buy a property there. Um, a young couple who have property and always want to invest. They, they're looking for uh, the deals out there and they're seeing a few. They bid and see what happens. They're only putting five percent down, so they have a chance to uh, own a bigger property than what they what they've got right now. Um, wow, yeah, just move move up, move down. Um, unfortunate deaths are are occurring as well, and then they take the money from uh, their inheritance and buying property that way, or move to a different property so that the they're not the same one that they're in there too. Uh, it's a whole mess of different people. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I always tell people, look, some people are ready to go. Some people are not ready to go and everyone's different, but I, it always just starts with a conversation, a casual conversation. I like to tell people who don't really know me because in real estate too, we talk to a lot of strangers. I talk to a lot of strangers and sometimes I'll sit down in somebody's house and they've never met me. And I feel this like wall, this barrier of, I can't be vulnerable with this person because I don't know who they are and right, what yeah. if he takes advantage of me and all this stuff. And I get it. And I like to usually like, I like to point out the elephant in the room and I'm like, I get that we're strangers, but all I want is to learn more about what you want and then give you some advice on what I, what I would recommend you do in your situation based on my experience. Right. And sometimes it's, it works for them and sometimes it doesn't, but it always starts with a conversation. I'd rather know then always wonder and regret, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think just kind of going back to when we first started, a lot of people think, well, I'm not really, I don't want to really meet with a, a realtor or a lender until I'm ready. Um, so I'll just do that. And it's like most of our clients, I would say if I had to take all my clients and, and say on average, I would say on average when we meet a client to when they buy is somewhere around the six to eight month mark. Right. You know what I mean? Some of them, so look, some of them come to us and say, I got to sell right away. What's the next step? Some of us come, some people come and say, I found you on Zillow. I read your profile. I want to work with you. I've already spoken to a lender. Let's get started. You know, but most people I think need that, that nurturing. They need that, that, that their information gathering. Yeah. And, and, and any, so anybody out there that's watching this video, that's like, okay, enough's enough. I got to talk to somebody and get some clarity on my situation. Cause Dude, you and I both know Google can be a scary place to be when you're looking for information because there's so much conflicting information out there. Sometimes you, I'll Google something and then I'll read it and I'm like, oh, that makes sense. And then I'll like, oh, it's in Nashville. That doesn't apply to California. So, you know, it's always, there's so much value in talking to a local professional about your situation. You get all the answers that you need. You understand what you're getting into. And then if it makes sense, we keep moving the needle forward. And if it doesn't, then we put you on a plan to kind of get what you want when you want it, right? So we work with all kinds of people. Um, Tim, thank you so much for being here today. Do you have any final thoughts, anything that you have been dying to share this whole time, but I talked too much and you never got it out? Actually, I, I do have a success story of a, a young couple, again, with, with, with children who were working with the team for... Um, well over a year and we just crunched numbers and crunched numbers and it just never seemed to be the right time. And they recently just got into a home. I didn't get the loan because they're, they're buying brand, brand spanking new. Um, so the builder's lender uh, gave them the incentives and that's great. I, 
because I felt that I was a part of the whole process. I educated, I helped, I answered questions and so on. And I don't feel bad losing the loan because eh, it's, there's plenty of them out there. And these people are happy, they're educated, and they're going to refer business to myself and to the team because of that. Not be, they won't talk to the lender. The builder's lender is great. Give them the right price, done. The relationship that I built with those folks, priceless. Dude, and, I, and you know what? You're amazing when it comes to that because we've had clients, this has happened more than once. Yeah. Right? This happens a lot. Unfortunately, you know, the new home construction companies, they want you to work with their in-house lender and uh, they offer incentives. I think, I think I've seen as high as if you work with a lender in-house, we'll give you a $10,000 credit on upgrades. Right. right. They don't tell you that those upgrades are about five times marked up though. <laughs> But, but at any, at any rate, um, and Tim, every single time you're like, I get it, right? Like if you're going to get $10,000 in upgrades and that's important to you, then you have my blessing. And I've actually heard you say you have my blessing. Um, whereas somebody else might be like, I can't believe you're doing this to me. I spent the last three months working with you and now you're leaving me over 10 grand. But like, you're just, you know, and I, I get both sides of the story here because, you know, yeah. I'm a realist and I get it. But the way you handle it is always so great. And you're right. They're not going to refer to the lender that they were forced to use because of a $10,000 giveaway. They're going to work with a lender that they remember treated them like, like they should have been treated, right? One of my favorite sayings is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, man. I mean, it just sometimes the cookie doesn't crumble our way. But you and I are in it for the long haul. And, and we want like le legitimately, we want to do good by people. Um, and, and that's what we do. And sometimes we get paid for it and sometimes we don't, but you know, hopefully that turns into referrals. Cause I think people know where we're coming from. So exactly. dude, you're awesome. I appreciate your Thank time you, so much. And yeah. uh, dude, I'm looking forward to the next one. On, on our way. Absolutely. Thank you for the time. All right. Bye guys. If you were watching, thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Take care. <laughs>